Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's meeting. Uh, as usual, I'll just give us a minute or two until it looks like we kind of level off on participants and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, I think I think we'll go ahead and get started here. It looks like we're we're leveling off on the participant numbers. Um, so welcome, thank you for joining us. My name is Marlene Wagner. I'm I'm the South Coast Policy Lead for the agency. Um, I'm just going to get started by going through our our Zoom meet call logistics and ground rules. Um, so you can turn your camera on and mute or unmute yourself through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. We're going to keep folks muted during the beginning of our program, and then we'll unmute you and we open it up for questions and feedback. Uh, callers can unmute themselves by pressing star six on their phones. We ask that you raise your hand to ask a question, and you can access this through the control panel at the bottom of the screen. You can also raise your hand by hovering over your face or name on the list of participants. Callers can raise their hand by dialing star nine. Please be respectful of others. Uh, mute your phone or line when you're not speaking. Uh, be tough on issues and questions, not on people or organizations. Please don't make any personal attacks, insults, or threats. Uh, be sure we're listening to each other and speak and act professionally and allow for a balance of speaking time. If you have any technical issues during the call, you can use the chat button and, and we'll help you through those. But please don't use the chat for questions or comments because we're gonna take those live. Um, and this meeting is being recorded. So again, we're here uh, as part of the 2023 North of Falcon process to talk about Grace Harbor and Willapa Bay uh, fisheries. Um, and we're gonna have a discussion regarding some of the things that we show you today. Um, so we're kind of in the middle of this North of Falcon process. Uh, we've met with you twice so far this year. Um, basically, what we're doing right now is uh, we've forecasted the abundance of each stock and we've determined uh, what the harvestable surplus is. Um, after that, we model fisheries to determine which stocks are constraining. We predict what we'll catch and depending on the area, we negotiate with our treaty tribes and other states. And so right now we're basically in an iterative process between number three and, and, and four and five there. Here's our regional North of Falcon public meeting schedule, kind of what's left uh, in the year. We're here March 30th for our joint Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor fisheries discussion. Um, this weekend, the second Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting begins and it lasts through April 7th. And on April 12th, we're gonna meet back with you here to discuss uh, our final fisheries packages for both bays. Everything on this slide is clickable, and if you want to see all the meetings and all the previous recordings for anything that's happened so far this year, you can click the link on the, on the bottom of the page. Um, this slide shows where the current ocean alternatives are with a high, mid, and low option. These quote alternatives are going to be narrowed down to a single option uh, after staff had to PFMC this weekend. 
Uh, right now, ocean quotas are very similar to last year for coho, and Chinook quotas are, are a bit higher this year than in, in 2023, or 2022, pardon me. Um, so we're going to move right into our Grace Arbor management objectives and fishery proposals. So our management objectives for 2023 in Grace Harbor uh, include the following. So uh, we're not going to be able to offer a Shehala Spring Chinook fishery this year. Um, we're going to manage hump tulip Chinook, Shehala's Chinook, Grace Harbor Chum, and Shehala's Coho to achieve spawning escapement objectives. And because for hump tulips Coho, we have not met escapement objectives three out of the last five years, uh, we are subject to a 5% impact rate cap. And with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to our Grace Harbor fish biologist, Mike Sharp. Thank you. Good, e good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I will start off by saying that this meeting might be a little shorter than what we typically uh, have during this particular meeting in, in the process. Uh, typically, <clears throat> there's a week or two between uh, the North of Falcon meeting that we just finished this week and the PFMC two meetings, which start basically this weekend. And, and during that time, we usually get the opportunity to do a little more of uh, fishery shaping with our co-managers. Uh, we don't have that opportunity this year. Uh, we've had the initial exchange of um, fishery packages from our co-managers and that time that we used to have prior to going to uh, PFMC is, is now not there. So we have to do all that work uh, when we're in California this coming weekend and next week. So um, again, uh, not a lot of new information to provide just because we haven't had that time frame, which we typically do to move forward with the process. So I, I wanted to get that out there right away, uh, just in case you guys feel it's a little short. Uh, might be a good thing as the Mariners first pitch is somewhere around seven o'clock, and I think we would all enjoy that. But uh, anyways, for Grace Harbor, the, I'm going to hit some review here. Um, there were a couple of uh, things that were talked about that we would like to implement in terms of conservation and uh, some measures to uh, order up some fisheries. Uh, one of those was in the West, West Port. West Port Boat Basin. Um, it was a suggestion to um, uh, restrict some gear to, to uh, kind of clean up some snag fisheries that were going on out there. Lots of complaints were happening. And so we worked with enforcement and came up with uh, a regulation that we think we can implement that will not um, restrict fishing, but it will hopefully clean up methods of fishing and allow people to continue to fish for those coho that return there. Uh, the second one, uh, a, a some conservation measure for Chinook and the Wainuchi and Satsap during the August and September time period. Typically, we aren't allowing a uh, salmon retention during that time period. Uh, and, and there are Chinook, uh, depending on flows and, and environmental conditions that will stack up in some of these reaches. And so we are going to implement a selective gear rule for August and September. Uh, it's not going to preclude fishing. It's just going to change how people are fishing so that those targeting uh, trout, which is open at that time period, can still enjoy that opportunity why we provide some protection against our the Chinook that are stacked up there. We've also had uh, some comments about the jack fishery, in, in particular, uh, its impact on wild or adult Chinook in uh, that fishery, and some suggestions and ideas on how to maybe um, reduce some of those encounters on adult uh, Chinook while still providing an opportunity for people to target jacks. And, and I think what we've concluded so far is that we're going to do a, an evaluation of the environmental conditions that we see this fall. And if we have extremely low flows like we've seen the last couple of years, uh, we might then 
<clears throat> think that a selective gear rule uh, may be implemented through the emergency regulation process in order to provide some protection for uh, adult Chinook. If our environmental conditions are such that we have plenty of flow and fish are moving as we, we typically see them, maybe we don't need to put in uh, any kind of measure. And, and so I think a wait and see, um, to see what the environmental conditions are, is, is a prudent move uh, to provide protection for those uh, adult Chinook in the main step shadows. So that's on that. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you guys all saw this at the last meeting. It's getting really small because we threw in a third package option there. Uh, it's just simply running through what we did last year. A model A was simply, there were a couple of red marks or red boxes in the model uh, when we put in last year's season with this year's forecasts, some quick uh, small adjustments to turn those boxes green, that's model A. Uh, last year, we had a little bit of uh, restriction on coho in the Chehalis due to uh, uh, the uh, three out of five year rule of making the escapement goal. We, we got commission to give us a little breathing room on that, but we still had some restriction where we had a one bag limit uh, in November and December. Uh, so we took a shot at what, what would it look like if we increased that opportunity because we have those uh, impacts available. So model B is simply uh, increasing the bag limit um, to two fish keeping the Chinook season the same, release uh, Chinook on the Chehalis, uh, selective, uh, mark selective in the hook tulips. And then there was some comment uh, at our last meeting that said, well, you know, what if December is not really available for us? Could we move some of those impacts uh, during the December fishery and, and put it towards a three fish limit? <clears throat> so model C is, simply looking at what would it look like to have three fish bag limits uh, earlier in the season and then close the fishery down uh, at the end of November. So those are the, the four models that uh, we, we've kind of been looking at. C is the new one. And so what does that look like in terms of numbers? So next slide. Um, it, it's quite interesting. That, for Chehalis Coho, uh, you see the numbers there. I think the the real number that you should look at are the fresh water in the Chehalis Coho. You'll, you'll see that between models B and C, C was going to a three fish limit, no fishing in December. It actually produces fewer Coho. But what it does is it increases the number of wild coal being harvested. Same thing on the hump tulip side, a uh, little bit less coho, but more wild coho, which then pretty much tells us December is an important um, hatchery component uh, during the harvest. I didn't expect that to happen, but when you, when you threw everything into the model, uh, that's what we saw, that was the outcome. So, we can still do that. It's 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 almost a wash in terms of coho numbers, but we're increasing our impacts on the wild part of that coho when we do a three fish limit. Um, I added to this uh, particular table under um, Grace Harbor coho. I thought it was important to throw in some sharing uh, information. Uh, you'll see there that freshwater is freshwater sport the number of coho, hatchery, and wild combined, then your, your two to marine area coho, and then non-treaty commercial. And you'll notice non-treaty commercial doesn't change in any of these options. Again, the adjustment we had to make in that fishery was going to tangle net in week 43. Uh, we don't have a means in which to adjust the catchability of a, a tangle net versus a, a regular gill net. So the impacts are the same. So we won't see any adjustments there because we didn't change the number of days per week. 
So interesting information there. Um, Chum, uh, not much to say about Chum. They're there, they're available. Uh, some people like them. So uh, another piece I threw in there, and, and this is just more for inform informational uh, perspective. Uh, there was comment in the first meeting, and I think even in the second meeting about uh, the escapement goal of Chinook and how that is looked at in, in terms of what fish make up that goal. And uh, last time I explained that it's how many fish put eggs in the gravel. And, and that's based on the evaluation that was done, included periods of time when uh, hatchery fish were not marked. So there was no way to determine how many of the spawning in the recruits per spawner evaluation, how many of the spawners were of what origin. So it, it, it simply is how many fish put eggs in the gravel. So in, in the NOF, uh, during that first meeting, some people commented that that box was red. And so uh, in the model, and I think you guys all have this model, I, I won't tell you, I won't get deep into the model, but you, you can look at it. Uh, in the NOFT um, uh, proposal, it left a little over 10,000 unmarked natural origin Chinook in the escapement. And then there's a number under the hatchery of all of those hatchery fish that were not predicted to be harvested in any of the fisheries they're gonna escape the fisheries. They're either gonna to go to the hatchery or they're gonna to go to the spawning grounds. That's what they do. They, they either go one way or the other. And, and over the last five years, on average of those fish, hatchery fish that escaped fisheries and went to wherever they were gonna go, about 60, a little over 60% of them actually decided to go spawn while in, in the wild. So we can use that as a means to uh, try to predict how many of the hatchery escapement will either go to the hatchery or to the spawning grounds. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to show here in that NOFT, even with your hatchery escapement, would not make the escapement goal for Grace Harbor Coho, or Chinook, sorry. But all the other three models will make the goal. So I, I think that was important to kind of get that information out um, and to just have you guys see that and hopefully understand that. So um, that's where we sit right now. Um, and what's the next slide? Okay, before we go there, uh, we did meet with the Quinaults up in Linwood and we exchanged initial um, season structures. And that's all the time we had. Um, there is some work to be done, as we all know, that once we get uh, their 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 plan, uh, we need to work on things. There's some overlap and whatnot. So, um, and they understand that shaping is going to have to happen. And as I said earlier, the week we used to have between the two meetings was where we could do a lot of that work. And, and that's where I'm, I'm a little short and able to give you guys uh, anything definitive. We have to now go down to California and get it done as quickly as possible. Um, it, it's some aspects of it is very similar to last year. Um, a couple of other things that need really kind of shaping. Um, but like I said, oh, and I also should have said earlier that these three, these four models have now, except for the NOFT, a, B, and C have been updated with the Quinault information. So uh, the escapement for um, Chinook includes their updated um, plan. Uh, I'm trying to think if I can give you guys anything more about what we learned in, in Linwood, but really at this point, uh, We've already got a meeting scheduled down in California with Quinaults, so things are going to happen, but they haven't happened yet. So, so with that, um, I look forward to taking questions later after the little bit bait piece is done. So, thanks.
Thank you, Mike. And now we'll move on to our Wellpa Bay management objectives and fishery proposals. So our 2023 management objectives for Chinook and Willapa Bay come from interim guidance provided by the Fish and Wildlife Commission. So we're directed to actively manage not to exceed a 20% natural origin Chinook impact rate in the Nacelle and Willapa rivers. Commercial fisheries will not have time and area restrictions south of area 2T. We'll determine daily limits for recreational fisheries that also achieve management objectives for Chinook and Coho but provide for a full recreational season with recreational priority for Chinook harvest. We'll also continue the update and implementation of test fisheries and in-season update models, and hatchery fish will con continue to be released at their facility of origin. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, continuing on with Willapa Bay management objectives for coho, we'll manage to achieve the aggregate spawner goal of 13,600 natural origin fish. We'll prioritize commercial fishing opportunities from September 16th through October 14th, and then provide recreational fishing opportunities. For CHUM, uh, we'll manage to achieve uh, the aggregate spawner goal of 35,400 naturally spawning CHUM, uh, provide commercial fishing opportunities, and then provide recreational fishing opportunities. And now I'm gonna hand the microphone off to our uh, marine recreational and commercial fish biologist, Barbara McCullen. Thank you. Can everyone hear me and see me? Yep, we can hear you, Barb, thanks. <laughs> Um, I'm so I'm going to walk through this table here um, that we have for Willapa. I'm going to um, these models right now that we, we have here A through um, well B through F basically represent models um, for suggestions that we've heard from the public. So starting at the top with model A, I'm not going to walk through the entire thing, but I do want some I want to provide some clarification for this first model um, for this NALF model that we shared this model last week during our meeting. And in reviewing the model since then, I discovered an error. So that error has now been corrected. And the data that you see here are the result of that correction. So all of the models after A from B to F um, are based on this corrected mouth model. The other part of that is, is that um, if you were present during last week's meeting, you might recall that the NALF, excuse me, the NALF showed um, that we had a 14%, 14.7 and 16.4 natural Chinook impact rate for Willapa and Nacelle rivers, respectively. With the error corrected, those impact rates are now 15.1 and for Willapa River and 15.3 for Nacelle River natural Chinook. And you can see those um, those data there in that in the table corrected. So instead of walking you through every single data point on this table, I'm just going to highlight a few things so that you can take note of that and then you'll see the fishery descriptions that Jody's gonna walk through on the next slide. So in this model um, or in this table, you'll see that all the fishery proposals meet our management objectives for natural origin or natural Chinook impact rates and are below 20%. All of the proposals here that you see do not meet the natural origin Chinook escapement goal of the 4353 that you see listed above. Um, but all of the pro, pro <clears throat> excuse me, all of the proposals do meet the natural origin coho escapement goal, and as well as the chum one, except in model A, which is the NALF, which is last year's fisheries and this year abundances. So keep in mind that um, all of the data that you see on the right is expected harvest by sector. Um, the part, part to keep in mind is, is that the rec recreational harvest is a combination of both the marine and the freshwater, and the Chinook expected harvest that you see there um, is hatchery fish only because we're marked selective in the Chinook. So this is expected actual harvest. So now I'm gonna, um, oh, the other part that I wanted to mention is here at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that there's a description of the fisheries um, that are listed for each of these model um, letters. And models D through F are commercial proposals that we received today. The fishery, the recreational fishery in each one of those remains the same throughout all three models. Um, the other part is that you can find all of this plus the actual TAM, a PDF of the actual TAM model if you want to look at line by line. That's been posted on the website and it went out in an email just prior to the meeting to the distribution list. 
So, um, so now I guess I'm going to pass it on to Jody so she can walk you through the actual fishery descriptions that are um, relative to these each of these models. Thanks, Barb, for that. Um, so here we have, as Barb described, the Willapa Bay modeled fishery description, and there's a lot going on on this slide. Um, so I'll walk you through it uh, the best that I can. So starting all the way at the left, you've got on the top, um, we've got model run. And similar to the last page, you've got the NALF, model B, model C, D, E, and F subsequently down. And as you go across, you'll have the fishery, the total daily limit, total adult limit, uh, what the Chinook fishery, as Barb mentioned, uh, Mark selective fishery, and this year we'll be releasing all unmarked Chinook in our fisheries. You've got the natural coho daily limit, as well as the hatchery coho limit and the chum. And so as we step down through each model, um, with if you were with us last week or at our last meeting, you'll you'll see that the NALF is <clears throat> new abundances with last year's fisheries. And so that's mimicking exact fisheries that were last year. So we'll take another step down and head to model B. And all of the uh, marine area, marine recreational area will be an adult daily limit of two mark selective fishery in for uh, Chinook with a, uh, a two coho daily limit of naturals and hatchery. And in the freshwater uh, for model B, this is a adult daily limit of two mark selective fishery. It's also uh, one. So in this particular model, it's modeled as last year's fisheries. Uh, so that would be um, uh, two natural coho, I'm sorry, two daily limit with one wild uh, retention of coho and with the Palix mid Nema and South Nema closed in that model. Uh, model C, D, E, and F in the freshwater all re represent a daily limit of two coho in the North Willapa, North Nema with a three fish coho limit on the nacelle after October 15th. And that is similar for models C, D, E, and F. And then in the commercial fishery, you've got, um, it's it, there's a lot to read here, but each, as Barb mentioned, each model D, E, and F were a different proposal that we received from the commercial sector. And for CHUM, with all of these fisher, fishery proposals, we have retention for CHUM. And I think I'm good on that slide. So with that, uh, you know, we'll now open it up for questions um, from you folks to, to hear your thoughts on, on both of Grace Harbor and Willapa mixed together. Um, it's important to note that we do have a link here to submit any of your North, North of Falcon related public comments that you have. And if you're not part of either the Grays Harbor or the Willapa Bay distribution list, um, please join us and send an email to either one of those um, email addresses listed there and uh, we'll get you added to our email address, our email distribution list where we send out mo these models, our presentations and throughout the um, commercial and recreational season, we also send out um, kind of highlights each week, highlighting what uh, the fishery is looking like through the week. Yeah. Okay, and it looks like our first hand is from Neil. Neil, go ahead. I can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, uh, first, uh, I guess this is just regarding the Grays Harbor recreational season settings. Uh, wanted to voice support for either model A or B. Uh, just seems like it's most similar to what last year was. <clears throat> and then uh, I think the reason for that just is I think most people would prefer additional days on the water versus just an increased limit. Um, and then I had a question on model C where it says a three fish bag for hatchery systems only. I'm guessing that would be like the sats up, um, but that wouldn't include rivers, you know, like the, the Wainuchi or things like that. Yeah, when, when I, we put it together, we thought it was probably pretty important to 
uh, limit that to uh, Wishka, uh, Satsa, Mainstem, Shehalis, and Skookumchuk. Cool. Yeah, definitely agree on that. Cool. Um, yeah, that's all I had. Thank you. Our next hand is from Patrick. Patrick, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, absolutely in favor of support uh, model B. Um, it is 100% unnecessary to give a three fish limit. Um, you know, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse here a little bit, assuming we're going to get what we're going to get. Um, but I don't think anybody reasonably needs three fish a day. And that's coming from a fishing guide. Um, but also with that, I think it's really important that we we don't dangle this December fishery in front of all of us. You know, we kind of need to get that figured out. And, you know, whether we have to bump up the timeline with these steelhead issues instead of having it on November 30th and putting regulations in place starting the next day, I, I think we need to get, you know, our, our steelhead thing kind of figured out a little bit ahead of time, if that makes sense, Mike. Um, and James, if he's listening, you know, maybe in September or October, we can kind of figure something out if we're going to even practically have a chance at December instead of just saying we will and then every year oh, pull the rug out from underneath of us kind of thing. Certainly, I agree with what you're saying, and that is our goal is to get something out there earlier because we certainly understand that people are making plans and some of them are are put way in advance so yeah yeah so i mean like like, like you said to me last year mike there's a there's a 2.4 percent chance of catching a wild steelhead in the sats up in december so i mean well, that's pretty close to zero to me um and considering the brood stocking and stuff that's gone on you know lately i i, I think we can afford a 2.4 percent risk in december so i i think we need to make some better strides at at getting that hatchery coho fishery back yeah so, and and if i can continue there you you mentioned the 2.4 one of the key things that we need to make sure of is that we are able to document that and, and monitor it by uh, having boats on the water by having folks out there boots on the ground so i'll, I'll let james uh add a comment Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Patrick, thanks for speaking up. Um, for those that aren't, you know, that are on the call that aren't, you know, informed with sort of these past decisions. Uh, so we've had this closure in December in a variety of systems on the coast. Um, it's pretty frustrating when we manage or design a December salmon fishery and then have to close it for steelhead. So uh, I'm with you, Patrick. A um, couple things to know. We know steelhead are spawning right now. So that information that we need for forecasting future runs, just there's just no physical way to get that information. So we're going to run into this problem. But uh, Patrick, I know you think about it almost as hard as us, um, and you recognize this steelhead problem in the Chehalis isn't just going to go away. Uh, we don't need a bunch of modeling to know that steelhead are going to be in trouble for a few more years at least. So uh, Mike and I have explored this idea that if we're you know going to have closures in December and we we think it's high likelihood is there some way we could shape the salmon fishery uh in a major way that gives anglers the choice folks on the call the choice to say would you rather gamble with that december and hope we get our monitoring plan in place and hope we get co-manager agreement to go fishing on a stock that's a couple thousand fish below escapement so that's the gamble we've done for the last few years or do we just want to close in december all salmon fisheries decide that now or you know in the coming weeks and uh boost opportunity earlier in the season um so use those impacts that would have occurred in december and get the most out of them in november so i don't think we prepared a bunch of those models because i think in general we want to fish in december and that's what we want to target but we also know it doesn't change the fishery in a major way it's hard to get those impacts back in november so a lot of little details there, but I just want you to know we're thinking hard about it. It's super frustrating. Um, and the goal here today is still to fish in December. So that, that's what we're going for. So we're stoked to design salmon fisheries in December and uh, really hope we can pull that off with the steelhead constraints. We're going to have likely later, uh, you know, six months from now, we're going to be talking about those. So 
Anyway, thanks again, Patrick. Thanks. thanks. Our next hand is from Francis. Francis, go ahead. Unmute. <laughs> we can hear you. Okay, so just for a little clarity, um, I, I heard the thing about in um, sort of monitoring the prevailing conditions for flow. If we're low flow, high temp, we've got fish kegging up. I'm spe specifically talking about Chinook here. That we would go ahead and drop a uh, just a selective gear rule. Are we are we are we abandoning this idea of the no bobber? Uh, just I, I would say no, we haven't abandoned it yet. It, it's something as we move forward, we can say, hey, at least we're going to do something. This is something that we can do. The enforcement guys can can enforce that. But okay. it definitely we we can continue that discussion. Okay. I was I was just thinking about you know, even even before we have the low flow concern that a jack fishery is going on, the jack fishery is extremely bait intensive. Uh, mostly eggs, other kinds of bait too, but the jacks are readily be, are readily catchable with a you know uh, drift a classic drift fishing technique where the gear is bouncing along on the bottom and you catch all the jacks you want without using a bobber and eggs big old gob of eggs to target adult kings that are kegged up in holes which would be totally legal, um, but uh, you know. You know, it, you can say, yeah, I'm fishing for jacks, but there, there's going to be a Chinook impact there. So I just, I just didn't want that to die on the vine. I just, I, I didn't hear about it when you were making your presentation. And then the other part is the red boxes on Chinook for both uh, hump tulips and Chehalis. Uh, were those red last time before you planted the the Quinault schedule in there, the new modification. Yes. They were they were both red. Yeah, they were both red. Okay, so even with with the new schedule they put in, yeah, they're still red. But we're still satisfying all of our our state obligations on our half of the fishery. Is that correct? Yes, and, and I will say, uh, and and it, I think you were on your phone and didn't didn't see the computer, but. If you add in the hatchery escapement that is destined to the spawning grounds, all three of the A, B, and C models will achieve the natural spawning escapement goal. Correct. Not necessarily it's, natural origin, though. But not, no, the goal is a natural spawning goal. Correct. It's we no just problem. won't achieve it with natural origin fish Got it. Uh, based on any of the models. All right, thank you. And our next hand is from someone on an iPad, it looks like, or some sort of tablet. Um, I'll prompt you on unmute, go ahead. Uh, it looks like it, you're in, on an ASUS. Pad. Um, there you this go. Too, okay, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Hey, uh, I got uh, first a question to Mike Scharf about Grace Harbor, and then I've got several things on Willapa. Um, Mike mentioned a snagging issue for coho, and I would appreciate if he could maybe expand on that. Yeah, that was within the Westport Westport Boat Basin. Uh, lots of complaints have been uh, uh, made uh, to local uh, um, by by local um, 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 business owners out there and, and people out there, and enforcement has been out there a lot. Uh, there's a few guys out there. I shouldn't say guys. A few anglers out there who have been using questionable techniques. Uh, and actually, it, it it just secondhand. I I wasn't out there to observe it, but some people have said it's it's gotten a little dangerous. So um, we're taking means in which to try to 
curtail that disorderliness of that fishery and make it a little more pleasant for everybody? Okay, my, my, the reason I bring this up, Mike, because I don't fish Grays Harbor, is I thought maybe it might be, uh, have something to do with twitching jigs. No, this was specifically within the Westport boat okay. basin itself. Okay, that, that answers my question. Thank, thank, thanks a lot. And sure. uh, nice seeing you, Mike. It's been a while. Well, I wish I could see you. I just see your name on a little square there. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, okay. A couple more things here. Um, uh, Jody provided me the uh, model uh, before the first meeting. And uh, Jody, thank, thanks for that. It allowed me to get some data out of that. Um, sure. I, I do support the three fish bag for the nacelles starting on October 16th with a one fish wild uh, bag limit um, I with, with the number of fish that, that are being surplused, uh, uh, those fish should be harvested. And um, so I do support that. Um, you know, I sent an email to staff um, the day after the last meeting because I was having some technical problems with attending the meeting. So, um, I'd, I'd like to know what consideration are you giving to the rule change I requested for a change in the barbless hook date? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I'm actually uh, just saw that email come through today. It didn't. Um, uh, it didn't make it to me. Um, so I apologize on that, and I will have to get back to you unless there Marlene or others on the team can speak on that behalf. So I do apologize um, uh, from myself on that one. Okay, so so here, here's what's happening because the last three years, uh, the selective gear rule goes into effect on uh, December 1st for the steelhead. And so uh, August 1, we start out with a barbless restriction. Uh, to protect uh, the wild Chinook. And um, it goes away on the 15th of November. But now with the December 1 selective gear rule, you got to go back to a barbless restriction. So what I've requested is that that date uh, where the anti-snag uh, barbless requirement goes away rather than on the 15th of November, it goes away on the 1st of November, giving us a month to fish with barbed hooks to harvest those coho. The, the Chinooks are gone. Uh, you look at your uh, escapement reports, there, there simply are no recruitment of Chinooks after the 1st of November. Mm -hmm. So I'd really like you guys to consider that. Uh, I think there's a lot of us that would appreciate that. Okay, so, um, um, Last year, uh, and for several years now, I've been talking about twitching jigs and the impacts that it's having on those of us that use ethical methods to fish for fall Chinook and on the nacelle. Um, James indicated last year that staff was reviewing this issue. I'd like to know what, what the status of that review is. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not going to correct you. Say I didn't say that, but I I will tell you across the state we've had a variety of proposals to sort of reduce this uh, snagging issue associated with jigs. Um, we don't have a formal review of that. So if I suggested we were working on a formal review, um, then that's that's incorrect. But um, we're thinking hard about that proposal, and um, for this season. I feel like uh, this may be the first time we've heard it, but we know it's on our radar. So uh, do you mind if you're comfortable with it, just um, letting us know what you're thinking about this year exactly in terms of the the anti or sort of uh, jig restriction rule? This is the first time you've heard of it? Uh, so this season, I'm not sure you and I have chatted about it, Steve, but no, maybe I'm no, mistaken there. No, we haven't. There. We haven't. Oh, I've, okay. but, but I've come to the last three meetings talking about the impacts this is having uh, essentially because of the failure of the agency to deal with this problem you've essentially legalized snagging there's really no point in having a anti-snag rule because everybody is fishing twitching jigs uh, that uh, want to catch fish 
except for those of us that are ethical fishers. And it's impacting our harvestability because those fish are being just hammered day long with those twitching jigs. They're being foul hooked. They become line shy. So now um, I noticed in the comments from the last meeting, someone proposed uh, a rule that would uh, basically require that if you foul hook the fish, that'd go against your bag limit. I, you know, that's that's a path you guys need to look look at, and and not from the standpoint of enforcement because we will video <laughs> that information and call enforcement if we saw that. That that is a way of dealing with this problem. Uh, it, it's. Uh, you know, we can't we can't harvest fish after eight, nine o'clock. It gets daylight. Uh, the fish are lighter, uh, leader shy. Uh, they, they won't bite. And it's because of all these twitching jigs that are being used. So uh, I really think you need to take a look at that. And I'd sure like to have a conversation with somebody uh, after this meeting about this. But it, this might be a way of maybe addressing this problem uh, and let let your constituents out in the field. us fishermen that really care about uh, an ethical fishery uh, to maybe help you out in that regard. So um, that's my comment on that. So, um, okay. Hey, the Steve, other thing um, is, Steve, if uh, I can just pause for a second here, because I know you got, I sound like you had one more thing you wanted to share. Um, there was a lot in that uh, twitch and jig proposal, and I want to make sure there's no chance of us, uh, you know, not exploring this further and knowing exactly what the details are. I wonder if you don't mind sending Jody uh, and or I an email just with this proposal. And so we can look at it and make sure we're not missing any pieces. Okay. I, and I don't know where that came, comment came from. If it was, if it was someone, you know, a, a public uh, comment, I assume that's what it was, but I just saw it in the, in the notes of the meeting. So, uh, but I, I'd be happy to do that. So, hey, that's great, Stephen. Yeah, apologies if we're making you repeat yourself, but really appreciate you just sending us that because I don't, I don't want to forget about it. Okay, okay. So you know, I mentioned that Jody had sent me some modeling information, and one of the things that caught my attention was that uh, you don't give any consideration for jacks as far as uh, uh, a, 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 your harvest strategy. Uh, there's a comment down down at the bottom that states that. Uh, but I and others consider a bright jack to be a bonus fish. Uh, a number of us keep them uh, and, and they, they go towards uh, the harvest of Chinook. Um, you know, with 5 million brood uh, being released uh, for the last two years, I mean, there's going to be considerable jacks coming back and they're going to increase uh, the possibility for harvesting those fish. So uh, some consideration for run size should probably be considered for that. Uh, minor issue, but uh, I just, I, I think you should be throwing something that way because they are being harvested uh, when they come in and they are bright fish. Okay, my, la my last comment is, um, I sent a great deal of data, your data uh, that I got off of your website, which substantiates that the adjustment you are making for hatchery chum returns are so far off, I can't believe you expect a reasonable person to believe it. You know, you're only forecasting 1,119 hatchery chum coming back to the bay, where the bay has been putting out two and a half million chum for four years now. And that, that equates to, that one, 1,119 equates to four tenths of a percent of hatchery fish returning, um, that that's unconceivable and just not founded in fact. Um, that you're you're using a factor, some factor that you mentioned in the last meeting, uh, to uh, determine what the actual run size is. But what you do know is the last two years you were predicting about a forty-five thousand. Return on chum, and in what? Where was it in the ninety to hundred thousand range? Um, that that adjustment is an error. 
and uh, it, it needs to be revised. It's simply not correct. And uh, you, if if that number, uh, the 1,119 and the 45,000 run size is what you go with when you, when you uh, prepare whatever seasons you're gonna prepare from that data, um, I'm probably gonna pursue that uh, through another venue. So just, just for your information. Thanks, Steve, I appreciate the comments. Our next hand is from Eric. Eric, go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, I attended the last Grays Harbor meeting a week, week and a half ago there. And uh, this question is for Mike and uh, it regards the Chinook conservation proposal you've got for Satsip Minucci in August, September, the selective gear. And a week and a half ago at the other meeting, I made a recommendation to limit that. I'm kind of I'm kind of supportive of the the idea, but um, put it into effect from Black Creek down on the Wainuchi. Has that been given any more consideration, or is it kind of dead in the water and it's just going to be from White Bridge down? Well, uh, at this point, uh, I think because that is the extent of where we allow salmon retention. It may draw attention, and uh, if we get decent flows uh, and some fish get up higher and then flows drop, then uh, that might put us into the same situation. Um, understand that you know the fish are only going to go so far if we have really low flows, but I think if we go all the way up to White Bridge, um, you know we we might have some impact on summer steelhead. Um, at that point in time, you know, August is when you're still catching quite a few of those, but July is usually the peak. Um, um, I will, I, I won't say I'm not totally sold on that. I'll have some more conversations with our enforcement officers. Uh, they have a better idea of where some of this activity may be occurring, and, and I'll get with the, um, I'll work with them on their recommendations. Okay. No, all right. Fair enough. Um, one, I guess I'd call it a compromise on my proposal then. Um, if, if it's still kind of the idea is floundering about that Black Creek idea, perhaps uh, leave August alone and implement it in September. Um, again, I, I understand you're, you know, wanting to see what the flows do and whether or not that gets the fish moving, but over a lot of years, we August just does not have the flow, and those Chinook aren't there. Uh, I just I just hate to see that mid river restricted, particularly like I say at least August. You know, with that rule, so I'd, I'd appreciate yeah. if you'd consider that. Yeah, I mean something that we could consider because we don't have summer run in the sats up that we release there. There may be a few there, but that might be a consideration to think that. Maybe we give August in the Wainuchi uh, a little more lenience. And, but like I said, I'm going to have to have this conversation with our enforcement guys as they are the ones that are typically out there in bigger numbers when they hear these types of things going on. So um, I, like, I like the conversation to have with them, um, especially on the Wainuchi, because of that summer run steelhead importance. Um, so, yeah, I, I will further that conversation. Uh, Gosh, within the next couple of days, because okay. that's all we have. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. And our next hand is from Garrett. Garrett, go ahead. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Uh, for Grace Harbor Fisheries, I would like to voice my support for option B um, with uh, a contingency of uh, in manage, in season management, if if we get to you know October November start seeing steelhead numbers, if if we're not able to uh, justify any December fishery, um, that we could implement uh, that three fish limit, um, so we can still get a bunch of fish. Uh, 
Uh, ultimately, I really want to see uh, in the upper basin, like from Porter upriver, um, that December fishery is really, really important to a lot of us in the upper basin. And uh, whatever, um, you know, whatever we've got to do to, to get our dad on our steelhead, you know, I've, I've, I've fished the river, that upper basin, Porter upriver for pretty close to 20 years now. And, you know, it, it's rare, it's rare for us to ever see steel it up in that, that neck of the river till at least until Christmas. Uh, so whether we got to get just more boots on the ground, get some more data, whatever we got to get figured out uh, so that we can justify that December coho fishery um, in the future. Um, and uh, just to make a comment on, I know there's some folks mentioning uh, some stuff on twitching jigs and people you know, unscrupulous anglers, anglers that are uh, snagging fish. Uh, what, what I would like to propose is um, on the twitching jig front is maybe we, if we can uh, stiffen the, the financial penalty for snagging. Um, you know, there's, some, there's some days on the river that uh, twitching jigs are, I mean, Sometimes it's 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 one of the only things that gets them going, and and uh, when to, when the, the method is used correctly and ethically, and I've had coho flat out swallow jigs. I mean they they love they love those jigs. So uh, we already have enough uh, challenges, you know, with you know rivers coming in and out and floods, and the last thing we need is a gear restriction to further hamper us. So. Um, that's what I've got for now. I really uh, highly support option B. Thank, thank you guys very much. Thanks, Garrett. And our next hand is from David. David, go ahead. There we go. You hear me? We can hear you. Okay. On uh, option two or B or whatever it is. Uh, and then, but option three, this December steelhead thing, uh, that that's an that's that steelhead season is a court thing between the tribes and everybody else. And the thing about it, there aren't there aren't Chambers Creek stuff around. You got it right. So you know, if really slammed against a wall and a nation doesn't want to budge on it, well, basically tell them to go pound nails because all you got to do to end that conversation is simply say December release all steelhead. You can keep the salmon, release steelhead, and put a knife in it, put a fork in it, get the issue done. Because the tribe season was set off the Chambers Creek stuff in the courts. They ain't there no more. The tribe still fishes it. They ain't going to give it up. But if there's a, like you said, it's two or two, two percent or whatever down, just release all, all steelhead in December and it goes almost to zero. So to shut the salmon down for steelhead, is a legal issue between you and the tribes, but the straight way through it is just release all steelhead in December. It don't matter if it's clipped or not. You just release it. The number of steelhead we lose, it, we would lose is small. We pick up a whole month of our winter season, and that's not much of a trade off there. That's an easy decision. On the uh, eggs, bobber bit. This problem with eggs and and the catch and release of chinook. Uh, it actually exists maybe a mile or so each way of Fuller Hill Bridge and up just below Schaefer Park and Assassin. That is the two major areas that it takes place in. If you're fishing down below for jacks, you hardly ever tangle with the Chinook because they're moving through at night and stuff, a lot of reasons. But the long and short of it is you don't blast the whole basin's fishery part because you have problems with people in a, basically probably about four miles of the river in the basin, okay? That's, there's gotta be a better way to solve the problem. And, as for, and finally, the Westport boat basin thing, back when a gentleman I used to work with managed the marina, he just hated when people got carried away down there in the marina and he was always on top of everything. Then the other side, the coin is a Steve Thysville who looked me straight in the eye and says, it's a put and take fishery. Who gives a damn as long as they don't use dynamite? And that's the other side of the deal. So that Westport Boat Basin thing, that's basic, just a view of how you look at things. You get a bunch of people that aren't really fishers 
They're mostly tourists or a few locals just hanging out down there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, what do you expect they're going to act like, especially with the tourists, anything? It's just the way it works. So tourist fisheries are not by nature uh, what I call pretty to watch. And that, that goes across all of you those charter boats there. Go watch a charter boat release fish, and that'll horrify you. It's no different in any fishery where there's a lot of people who aren't fishers by nature doing things. And so, you know, that's a thorny problem. But the other side of the coin is it's mostly a perspective problem. So, you know, that's all I got. But, you know, the, the jig thing, uh, <laughs> in my younger days, I learned how to fix up a wiggle wart. And I could snag with that bugger, especially when you drill a little hole and then put water and seal him up and he went down to about six inches off the bottom. You can snag quite well with it and still not get nailed by enforcement. So if somebody wants to cheat, you can cheat. I mean, it, I don't care if you're a wreck fisher, just a lot more of them than gill netters. You don't get after the gill netters for one idiot using his recovery box for a, a trash bin, okay? So why, you know, when you got a, and that's one out of 14 or 20 when you got like seven, 800 wrecks out charging around, use the same percentage. You're going to have, you're going to have bandits on either side. You don't go out there running the gill netters off the water because of one bad netter. You don't do the same with the wreck fishermen. It's an is issue enforcement wrestles with, and it'll be here until the end of the fish. I mean, that's all there is to it. So you know, and this, the way we seem to handle problems now is we don't think it through real hard. We just shut everything down. Well, that's kind of like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That's a little broad of approach in my view. So, and that's otherwise the second option looked big, looked okay, but uh, to, uh, uh, to give up straight, to go three fish limit will do nobody good in and if most of you, some of you haven't been through the whole process for years. It was Mike himself that showed us exactly what it meant. When you go from two to three, you'll be absolutely amazed how few people actually get the third fish. And if you go to four, how much less it gets. So all the three fish limit will do is enhance the traffic jam on the river, which is already the problem if you get right down to whether it be float bobber and eggs or this and that, there's a hell of a lot more of us out there. And when you keep adding to us, mayhem ensues. So, I mean, the three bag limits, the most ill conceived idea you've ever seen, and shutting down the December fishery, get three fish is crazy. And, number, and, let the, and to let the Quinault run rampant over us on that issue of salmon in December. Is not a good idea. The tribe's going to look after its own self-interest. That's what they pay those people for. Well, you guys are representatives. Don't roll over. It's about time. You just said, no, we will release all steelhead if we have to, and we're going to fish salmon in December. Now, our impact on steelhead is going to be awful small. If we don't make escapement, it's your, it's your baby. And just deal with it. I mean, there's no reason to roll over. And I'll shut up. Thanks, Dave. Our next hand is from Francis. Francis, go ahead. Unmute. Uh, I was just going to say, um, thanks, Dave, for that perspective on the three fish bag. Patrick Gaffney also said, who needs three fish? But, you know, if someone had to be lucky enough to get three hatchery fish in one day, I kind of have this saying, all hatchery fish must die. Uh, we don't want a PHOS problem. That's what they were made for. So if someone is lucky enough to get that third fish, if it's hatchery, take it. It's what it was made for. So all I was gonna ask when you guys model that, Mike forgot to say this when I first got on, but uh, it was on my mind. When you model it and you found you were gonna take more wild fish, under that three fish bag in November. Uh, was that model for any three fish? You could have three wild ones? Uh, or, or, or was it modeled with the idea that uh, no more than two wild and the third fish, if you were to get it, would be a hatchery fish? I did not model it that way. I modeled it as a three fish limit. 
three fish limit. Maybe. It could be three yeah. wild then. I, yeah. I think I think three wild would be excessive. And I, I did I did I did um, say that at, at the last meeting. Yeah. And, three and wild, yeah, we we had that three fish of which one could be wild or something like that. Th those are those are a little more difficult to model uh, to model and and some parts of the uh, um, some parts of the the time period you might be uh, cycling through a bunch of wild fish to get to that third or uh, hatchery fish. But uh, yeah. in this instance, I just ran it through through. Okay. All right. I, I think that I think that alone will explain why it it costs us more in terms of wild fish. But it was it was a good observation that you know the the hatchery component in December is perhaps underappreciated. Uh, when when you did that, since that was a that was a non non select kind of deal that you did there to to, to model that, um, and I would say that that would echo the testimony in at least the past two years of doing this by folks like young Mr. Garrett Moody, uh, who says you know there's a lot of hatchery fish to be caught in December as far as coal, and it's really important they're they're scoop hatchery fish and it's it's good to have access to those fish so if people really are against the 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 three fish bag in November we really ought to put a full court press to to fish in December and if it means just saying no steelhead whether it's hatchery or not uh, that's a small price to pay cuz there's not very many to start with and as much as I like my all hatchery fish must die mantra, I would I would turn loose a hatchery steelhead for the opportunity to catch a a coho in December. And, and with that, I'll I'll close. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And real quick, we have uh, one hit more hand up, and I'm just going to remind folks on the phone um, star nine to raise your hand. And if you're on the computer. Um, there is a reactions tab at the bottom of your screen, perhaps it looks like a smiley face or a raise hand button. Uh, you can also hover over your name um, to raise your hand. And our next hand is Ryan. Ryan, go ahead. Ryan, I oh, there you go. We can hear you. Oh, you get me? Yeah. Yeah, this is Ryan Gray, uh, Gil Nader and uh, Nacelle there. I've uh, been doing it since about 2007, and I just want to propose um, seven days a week on the coho fishery. Um, I was there when we did it, and it worked good, and I just want to push for that. So that's all I have. Thanks, Ryan. And that was our last hand for now. And we have a hand from Bill. Bill, go ahead. Hi, uh, greeting. Uh, this is for Mike. Have you established a Jack uh, opening yet? I haven't. I, 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 I'm not seeing anything at all on Jack openings on the show. Well, yeah, I don't know if I showed it in the little graph there, but it, it's the same as last year. Okay. And and uh, and I thank you for that. And and for the gentleman that fishes up around Porter, uh, I fished around the pump houses before the pump houses were there. And and for those, uh, and I fish in November and December. And it used to be open for salmon until the end of January. That's a little bit of history. And there used to be a lot of of not a lot, but there used to be hatchery coho that could be caught. They were headed for the Skookum Chuck or uh, some wild ones that were headed for the upper uh, Satsop River that were available in December and January. And and I've caught them. And, and again, I go back 40 or 45 years out there and in all that time, I've never caught a steelhead in December. And I know, although I'm using spoons and some other stuff, uh, uh, you would think that I would see, or maybe some of the bank guys catch a steelhead in December. I have not seen a steelhead caught. And to Francis, I know you don't like bobbers, but gentlemen, 
uh, I'm an avid jack fisherman and I fish the outgoing tide and with all the other bank uh, fishermen, but the advantage I have fishing out of my boat, when the tide turns, the bank fishermen go home because there's no sense casting out in dead water, okay? But with a bobber or a float, whatever you want to call it, I catch quite a few fish on the incoming tide where all the bankies are gone, bells out there catching jacks with a float. And it's a good fishery. It's a fun fishery because there's nobody around. I love it. Thank you. Hope that was not as emotional as I was last time, but December fishery, not being able to fish out of a boat definitely affects me as those that know me uh, and what my condition is now compared to the old days. I miss summer run fishing. I can't, I haven't been able to do that in three years now. So don't take my boat fishing away. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. We really appreciate your, your motion and your knowledge and your, your, your history. Our next hand is from Garrett. Garrett, go ahead. All right, you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, yeah, I just wanted to second some of the stuff on that uh, December as well with Steelhead. You know, last year we had that December 1st through 16th and uh, even though we were wanting to, con you know, conservation measure for Steelhead, it was still open for for hatchery steelhead and I even read new some news articles from some local fishing publications saying you know it you know the Chehalis is only open through the 16th of December for steelhead this year so if you want to get them go ahead and get out there and and wanting to make our our December coho fishery uh you know it's really our strong fishery that time of year as it is uh you know, if we run into conservation issues with steelhead again, why don't we just, you know, explicitly list that steelhead fishing is closed if, if that makes any difference, uh, you know, uh, just close steelhead fishing, uh, you know, whether that's mid-November, 1st of December, uh, if that gets us more days on the water for coho, let's do it. So that's all I got for now. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Garrett. Yeah. I this is James here, um, hearing a couple people on this call talk about this idea of a proposal with our co-managers um, that requires the release of all steelheads. So yeah, that's an idea we've thought of. We appreciate it. Um, the big key for us in that December fishery is monitoring. So that takes money and staff and time. Um, we need to demonstrate that we're keeping impacts low during that time period. And I understand all these folks on the call that have been fishing their whole life in December um, you know, are expressing that we catch very few steelhead, but in the Chehalis nowadays, very few steelhead, uh, matters, uh, you know, that one or two steelhead matters. So, um, Mike's done an awesome job getting our modeling work in that December period, um, sort of up to par so we can design a fishery well, um, but getting across the finish line with co-managers and making sure we meet our conservation objectives is still, still there. So, I appreciate all the feedback. Um, we're going to try everything this year, just like last, and uh, slowly make progress with increased monitoring. So thanks. Well, thank you. And our next hand is from David. David, go ahead. Uh, just the, the upper basin guys, those hatchery fish. Uh, for all those listening, everybody should understand the ones coming out of Bingham, last time I looked, it was 150,000 on a smolt release. And the upper basin, 300,000, are a late time stock by design with the work of the local communities. Now, they, they use three release sites on Alaska, which is a school, does it? A Creek, which is a sports club, and the scoop does 100,000 itself. Last time I looked, unless you moved them. So, you know, this saying everybody's looking about protecting steelhead, particularly the upper basin, there ain't hardly anything around in December steel -wise, steelhead wise. 
the, the tribe could give a damn less, be honest, because of the brawl that the, the, the long going animosity between the Chehalis tribe and Quinault is well known. And the Quinault would not do a thing to help the upper basin if they had to. They ain't going to do it. That's been there for since both, because one's a treaty tribe and one ain't. And that's the Chehalis. So, you know, the tribe could care less, to be honest. It, it, they're, 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 their dog is down here in Aberdeen, Hoken. And so when you look around at this thing and you say no steelhead fishing, it's about, to be honest, is uh, Aberdeen, the fisheries in the Aberdeen area have done the damage. The one in the uppers, not as much. And the uppers with the hatchery production on the mitigation on the scoop, it was designed that way by the agency with Jim Scott, the science division leading the effort to get it done. Okay, and then the deputy director back then, Mr. Peck worked into it. So this is a designed fishery off of mitigation fish. Okay, and it's late time to desire. So if the Quinaults are yipping about steelhead impacts and everything else, there comes a point when uh, it's kind of like calling, uh, it's kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. I mean, uh, the upper basin guys are limited to after the rain, that's the way the fish do it. And their best fishing is well into the rain time. When in the lower basin, unless you're on a tribs, you're pretty even wiped out unless you have good weather. And that's only good down to South Monty. The bay and lower tidewater are dead. So the long and short of it is, um, uh, it's kind of, it's not just a steelhead or a, or a wreck fishing deal. It's also a lower basin, upper basin. And you're, you're, you're taking abuses inflicted on the fish in the lower basin and cracking the crap out of the upper basin. And that's not exactly the way it should work, okay? Uh, WDFW managed all their fisheries, even old game. It was all about, particularly salmon, Aberdeen, Hokim, anything above lakeside asphalt plant, region six didn't care for it and fought tooth and nail. So it's taken the local communities better part of 30 years. Well, go, you have to go back about 15, but it was about 15 year window to get our recreational fisheries open. And you should not penalize the upper basin when they have a designed fishery and there ain't a fish like you're trying to protect even present. That, that just, um, that's just an awfully duplicitic way of running things. And that ain't fair at all. So. The upper basin guys, they got a right to beef. Uh, that there was a choice when the scoop mitigation come down, normal time or late stock. And the local community and the agency agreed on the late stock so they could have the fishing after the brownouts and everything early in November. So guys, this is designed fishery. Now you, you can't backtrack on these people now because of the abuses by the Quinaults or others. It's, it's two different communities. You're taking one, and beating the crap out of them. And the other one who did the, all the damage keeps skating on down the road. This is not the way you should be doing it, okay? Uh, it, that one just irritates me so much because I, I worked around the upper basin folks and I know the history there. So that's not right. No, I'll shut my mouth or I'll ramble forever. Thanks, Dave. That was our last hand. Um, just a reminder, star nine if you're on the phone. And we have a hand from Steve. Steve, go ahead. Yep, it's Steve. A couple things. Um, someone commented about switching I don't. Hey, Steve. Steve, we can't hear you. Steve, are you there? I'm here. Okay, we can hear you now. We couldn't hear we didn't we couldn't hear you at first. You were cutting out a lot. Oh, okay. So someone commented a while back about twitching jigs and about how effective they are in catching coho. Um Myself and number of my friends here in the nacelle use twitching jigs 
in, in the late coho season, and they are highly effective. I don't, do not disagree with that one bit. The problem is using them in the low water conditions, high water temperature conditions, where fish are being repeatedly foul hooked and, um, and, and ultimately they die. You know, my mother-in-law owns a thousand feet of frontage below the Highway 4 bridge on the nacelle. And I'm there routinely, especially late September into October, because I, I do not target those early coho until the river opens uh, above the bridge on the 16th. And, you know, I stood there on the bank last year. I, I could see a minimum of 20 fishermen. Every one of them was using twitching jigs. And there were three different holes I could see. And there was at least one or two fish on in one of those three holes continuously. And they were all foul hooked. Um, now, the fishers were not retaining those fish, but <laughs> what ended up happening is uh, there's a big back eddy there right below a steep bank. You know, I, I could see uh, at least a dozen carcasses down in that water, and I'm certain that those fish are there because they'd been repeatedly foul hooked and died. So uh, the issue is using twitching jigs in the early part of the season, from August 1st till like October, October 1st. Uh, th that's the issue. And, uh, and, and it's a big issue. It, it affects my fishery, it affects my friend's, friend's fishery. And this, something needs to be done here to correct that. Um, so, um, you know, James and I talked about this a little bit ago. Uh, I will send him an email with some ideas, but um, uh, he, he mentioned that he didn't remember a review. Well, him and I had several emails last year about this issue. Um, was review the right word? I don't know, but he indicated to me that staff was looking at it. Uh, you, you put whatever word you want with that. But for him to try to tell me that they weren't doing any formal review, uh, okay. Hey, if, Steve, if I'm right here. Path, um, you want to go down? Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah, I'm right here. I appreciate your comments. Just want to say um, we did talk last year, really great conversations around it. Um, we've heard some feedback here, folks uh, suggesting maybe the jig rule isn't right. So we need to think hard about this. If there's an issue that we want to deal with as fish managers, and we're going to have a, a gear restriction that maybe everybody is not excited about, um, we want to make sure it achieves the, the goal. So we're hearing you loud and clear. Um, I remember lots of conversations with you and they were really productive last year. So what I'm interested in hearing the proposal for this year, um, if there's work we could have done better last year, then let's, let's work hard to do that. But, uh, but I want to get your proposal on the board and make sure that we have a chance to look at it. So um, no criticism here. Just uh, let's, let's just get the info and keep moving. Okay. Uh, I will send you some information on that. And one other item. I've heard a number of people from Grace Harbor talk about that uh, December 1 uh, selective gear rule and the impact it's having. There aren't any steelhead uh, in December. Okay. You know, I understand when somebody says that in a public meeting, it's just noise. It's not based on fact. But what I sent you last year, James, was a detailed uh, recording of the escapement reports for all four weeks from 2013 to 2020 for steelhead re in the nacelle hatchery. And it shows essentially there aren't any hatchery steelhead uh, in the hatchery until well after the 15th of December. And I requested back then that you extend our selective gear rule until the 15th of December, which is reasonable. It's logical. It makes sense. Uh, but I've got nothing. And I think it's been two years I've been pushing this and I've got nothing. And as a result, the, the late coho 
which is a run that I individually got restarted because staff closed that season down and I was the one, I was the lead that made it happen. You're restricting our ability now to harvest those late coho uh, in the peak of the run, the first two weeks of December. It, it's unacceptable. It, it needs, you, you need to get, throw us a bone here and, and work with us. And uh, you'll allow us to fish for those coho. And as far as I'm concerned, if the answer is eliminating hatchery steelhead on the nacelle, do it. Uh, I'm good with that, but uh, the coho season is what drives uh, fishermen. The, you know, my mother-in-law owns a property right across from the public fishing area. We see it on a daily basis, and during that coho season, the fishers are there. And as soon as the coho are done, about the middle of December, they go away, and then there's a handful of guys that might fish for steelhead and sometimes none. So, um, and, and I know you're trying to have a consistent uh, rule that applies to the whole coast. But yeah, that's not, in the I, I gotta case, stop you, it Steve. simply doesn't work. I got, I got to stop you. Um, I appreciate all your feedback. Uh, um, so we're not trying to apply a consistent rule. I just, I, that's a place I need to correct you there. Um, river by river stream by stream. We're trying to meet escapement goals. Um, but I will say to everybody on this call, this steelhead one, man, this is a frustrating one. Uh, I know it is. Um, we don't want to be working so hard on it. We wish we had something we could just flip a switch on and, uh, and get these fisheries that all of us can depend on. But I want to remind people without digging in deep to steelhead, because we're focused on salmon. Um, want to remind folks that steelhead, uh, we're talking about when we encounter them, uh, when they enter the system, not when they're spawning, right? So, um, and I'm hearing a lot of people tell me there's very few steelhead in December. Um, so here's a group, you know, not just me, this management team. We've been looking at that and it turns out everybody's right. There's very few fish in December. We know that about five, some years, 8% of the run enters in December. So we're doing that math. Um, we need to demonstrate that our encounters um, are low, but they're also low enough to meet our, our uh, management objectives. So those like you, Steve, that have told us and lots of people on this call, there's very few fish in December. Uh, Mike demonstrated that last year with his team by creeling the first two weeks of December to really make sure we had a responsible fishery there that we were implementing. So we put a bunch of money at that. We demonstrated it for two weeks in December. That was really cool. And it was fun to tell everybody, yeah, you're right. We encounter very few steelhead. So we're building these tools. We don't have the finances to, to do it everywhere we want to right now, but um, the steelhead one's a frustrating one. Um, we're gonna keep working on it. We wanna get folks back on the water. I heard a comment there about closing hatcheries in the nacelle. First time I've heard that, first time I've thought about it, we're not closing hatcheries in the nacelle um, and that would not achieve our conservation objectives associated with encounters on steelhead in December. So not trying to be argumentative, but I just wanna make sure we're not mixing topics here. Um, so the goal is to fish in December, we're doing everything we can to get us out there. So uh, thanks everybody. I know the December steelhead thing is super frustrating. And I'm not seeing any more hands, Marlene. Thank you, Leah. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I just wanna remind everybody again that we're gonna meet back on April 12th, uh, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. to offer up the final fisheries packages. And we really look forward to seeing you then. And again, if you want to submit any further comments, you can do so by emailing any of us, or uh, as you see on the screen, there's a, a link to submit them electronically. If you wanna join either one of our distribution lists, uh, those email addresses are there. And, and we really look forward to seeing you in another week or so, or 12 days or so. Thank you very much and have a great evening.